Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, either attending or listening in to uh, the book launch uh, for Hong Kong Between uh, One Country and Two Systems, uh, a series of essays that were written from uh, the time of the start of the protests on the 9th of June 2019 through the enactment uh, of the national anthem and the national security laws for Hong Kong uh, in June of 2020. And of course, much has happened since then, but this is that critical slice that, uh, the, that bridge that separates the Hong Kong that existed from the, 1990, the end of the 1990s until 2019, and then the Hong Kong that appears to be emerging uh, after 2020. And I am just delighted to have with me uh, a, a small but intensely interesting uh, group of folks who will be uh, and who've been uh, willing to slog through all 31 essays, although that's what they're going to tell me whether they did or not. 31 essays and 400 odd pages of, of, uh, of material and, and help launch the book but by uh, talking a little bit about some of its themes, their uh, engagement with it and, and the like. Uh, and I'd love to introduce them just very briefly and then they can introduce themselves. I've, I've never been really good at, at introductions. I've got Matthew McQuilla, who is a recent graduate of the Penn State School of International Affairs uh, and my research assistant, who's probably read this book more than I have um, and who's been just uh, instrumental in helping me move this along. William Nee, who requires almost no introduction um, with Amnesty in uh, Hong Kong until very recently, and now with the um, what the, um, with the China. Um, I just saw your blog. Yeah, CHRD, China, Chinese Human Rights Defenders. Yeah, that's it. The Chinese Human Rights Defenders, a uh, great website in uh, based out of Utah. Is it? Uh, well, I, I'm based out of Utah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Are you? We're 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 kind of globally dispersed, so I don't really think we can. In this COVID days, I don't think we can say we're based anywhere. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Karen Wang, um, a former student uh, who is a, a professor of communications at Penn State and has written this extraordinary book on sacrifice um, and uh, in in China. And uh, Gao Shan, a uh, 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 former student as well, PhD in uh, the, the law school who is now uh, working in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, and so welcome all of you. I will take just two seconds to, to sort of introduce the context and then uh, I will turn it over to all of you. The, the, the way we'll, we will work it is each of you is free to just chime in and, and we can do it in order and then we can just uh, begin talking, just uh, kind of brief, um, engagements with some of these questions and then we'll, we'll just move them forward. The only thing I'd like to say beyond uh, the, the materials, Matthew and I have already been uh, uh, undertaking and we're going to finish this project over the, the course of the next month, is a series of interviews uh, with uh, for each of the 31 chapters and that each of them is about uh, 15 to, to 25 minutes long where we go into, into some detail, so I'm not going to do that. The only thing I wanted to, to mention here is that generally when, when people look at Hong Kong and the issue of Hong Kong, they focus on China, on uh, the Chinese system, on the, um, the trajectories, the historical and cultural trajectories and their potential conflicts or, um, or contradictions with that of the, of the People's Republic. And that is extraordinarily important, uh, both for the development of Chinese Marxist-Leninism, for the development of notions of sovereignty within China and of the, the new uh, imperial structures that are, uh, that are arising in the post-global world, not only in China, of course, but in the liberal democratic camp as well. Um, all of that is, is critically important, but 
it should, for me now, and, and especially now, the lessons that Hong Kong provides are not limited to a peculiarly Asian or a specifically Chinese context, uh, but indeed what I, I'm beginning to see, uh, and, and, uh, and now most recently evidenced in the events that are occurring even as we speak in Cuba, uh, is that the ways in which the stakeholders in this context responded, the development of specific discourses, the development of specific tactics, masses on the streets, governmental forces, uh, developing first rhetorical and then uh, physical responses, and the response of the uh, both the international community and the, uh, the liberal democratic states uh, has tended to now transpose itself from out of the, um, the specific context of uh, China uh, and its relationship with its own uh, special uh, region to uh, context well outside of that. Uh, Cuba is a great example uh, with the, the themes of uh, the legitimacy and an illegitimacy of violence, the notion of stability and chaos, uh, civil and political rights, and the, the positions that, that everyone, uh, all of the major stakeholders, the United States, uh, the, the government, the, the protesters are taking. So uh, with that, and, and, and so I'm, I'll try to draw some, some analogies uh, if, we, if we have a chance during the, the course of the, the launch. But with that, I'm just going to turn it over and welcome you all. Thank you all for, um, for agreeing to speak about this. And now I will stop. So why don't we start and, and we'll, we'll max it up, we'll mix it up a little bit. Let's start with uh, William. Sure, thanks, Larry. Um, so should I just, should I go to the questions or refer back to kind of general impressions or? Um, probably general impressions and then hit a question or so as you like. Sure. Well, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, thanks a lot for writing the book. I mean, I think one of my biggest impressions is that, um, as, as you said in your introduction, I mean, I was living in Hong Kong through this period. Um, well, I lived there from 20, 2007 to 20, well, till February of this year, um, and lived in mainland for six years before that. So, um, and during the protests, I mean, on like, let's say on any particular day, there, there would be great reporting um, done on Twitter by the journalists at, um, from SCMP, Hong Kong Free Press, um, Bloomberg. I mean, just many, many other people on the streets were doing great minute by minute what's happening um, on, on the events. And then we do, you know, wrap ups in, in their coverage. But in terms of what, what did it all mean? What, what did, how, how are narratives shifting? How are people interpreting it? I felt that that was something that um, there was never a, there was never that level of analysis um, to match the incredible amount of data and 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 you know and the amount of videos and pictures that were coming out on an hour by hour basis. So, from that point of view, I think that <clears throat> I think you present so many different interesting lenses to view it that it's it's really a lot of food for thought. Um, and um, I guess there's one, I mean, just one. Um, portion in one of your essays that I, I, I thought was very interesting, talking about, um, uh, let's see if I can um, find, find the question that you posed. Um, to, oh yeah, to what extent are the events driving decisions or leader decisions driving events? Does ideology and principle event inevitably lead to the actions taken or do the actions taken from ideology and action? So I thought that that was one interesting question um, and something that I had noticed, which I, I guess um, leads me maybe to answer one part of what did, I mean, I think there are many things the central government did wrong and Carrie Lam did wrong. And uh, you know, I, I, I could definitely go on and on and on about that. But in terms of number two, what did the protester movement get wrong? I feel one of the, I mean, it, it, it always sounds bad to kind of blame in some ways the victim, but I think the fact that 
events were happening almost democratically and that tactics were taken um, that in some cases didn't make sense. But then there was this sense of solidarity that people wanted to have, where then retroactively, you know, after the events were done, they would go back and kind of justify it. Um, and, you know, it, it I mean, it, to, to put a, a, a very kind of firm example on, on what I'm getting at, you know, I remember at the siege of uh, Chinese U and then at other universities where, you know, they got into the archery department and were shooting bows and arrows at the police, you know, and, and to my point of view, that was complete, completely tactically useless. I mean, in the best case scenario, they would have killed a police officer, um, which from my point of view would have been bad. I think that police officer's life has value and shouldn't, um, he shouldn't die. But even if they did kill a police officer or two, it would make no difference in the long-term battle and, and the use of force would have still been way against the protesters. But then everybody kind of justified it and said, well, you know, what are you gonna do? So I'd say that that, that issue of tactics, not, being re not having like a general in charge who could, who could say, I have, I have studied this, I know what to do. We're not going to do this, we are going to do this but rather having kind of the crowd make decisions tactically, often through voting on, on, on apps, and then retroactively having the movement kind of justify that um, was I think one of the weaknesses of, of this. And I think, as you said, um, it's not only about Hong Kong, but there are other protest movements that I think are arguably are suffering the same um, issues. And you know, thinking of the protests we saw last year in the US to some extent, um, so it, it's not just a, a Hong Kong phenomenon, but could potentially be a broadly applied. But I, I've already rambled as well. So let me give other people a chance. All right, well, thank you so, so much. Karen. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, I'm among the folks that uh, uh, had a kind of a very early sneak preview of the content of the uh, this book, and uh, it's very uh, impressed with uh, this uh, five hundred page tome on this uh, uh, <laughs> the context, right, and uh, 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 the fact on the ground, uh, uh, kind of reporting on uh, Hong Kong uh, protests, and this is uh, as someone that also did uh, or. It's doing some research on this uh, specific subject matter. Yeah, I must say one of the things that uh, stood out uh, the most, and uh, which makes this, I think, book helpful, is the uh, um, kind of uh, well, I mean, for lack of better term, the kind of a matter of fact, and objective, right? Uh, the language this book is. Uh, uh, written and I say this particularly because uh, this when it comes to well right it first of all is this a current event um, and it's still unfolding second of all uh, anything that's relating to let's just say Hong Kong protests uh, uh, these days uh, whether it's in the news media or even in right academic uh, uh, circles it's difficult to find, uh, let's just say, uh, detailed firsthand research on a subject matter that is not, right, obviously from one angle or another angle, right, uh, tinted with a kind of a, a very heavy political filter, right, uh, whether it's, uh, um, so, this stood out as uh, I think that's the uh, one of the uh, tremendously helpful uh, dimension in this uh, uh, book. It's uh, both what it, the content is matter of fact, but also that uh, you did a very good job, I think, in, in distilling the what mattered and what you know the kind of event right uh, that happened that uh, really mattered and uh, really shaped the uh, and had are consequential in the unfolding of this event that we're uh, witnessing. And um, so there are uh, a few, um, I won't say uh, 
let's just say it's not gaps per se, but it, it, they are things that, right, given a time frame, uh, uh, could not possibly be uh, addressed in this book because it, it's still largely unknown and some of it are, are speculative. So I think it will be very interesting to see how, uh, let's just say, in a uh, couple of years down the road, that's more information. And currently, of course, the situation in Hong Kong is still very much fluid and evolving unfold, how that would uh, inform us. And most notably, I think it's this uh, um, uh, connection, let's just say, between the, or if there's any, between the current spout of uh, protests, which this uh, your book mostly covered, 2019 to 2020, to the older, uh, or immediately, right, pre previous round of protests that took place around uh, 2014. And I think, uh, uh, well, William, you stayed there during that time too, so you definitely remember that, uh, right, the you know, started out as a student organized protest, and then, right, what happened in the legislative building, the night where the, right, bunch of, uh, uh, unknown uh, uh, black clad like protesters, they stormed. That was the first time that they sort of smashed the window and then the tear gas came in. And then that's a very kind of a, um, shocking, I think at that time uh, for local residents in Hong Kong for that, that sort of thing haven't ha didn't happen at least till the 19, since the 1960s and early 70s in Hong Kong. So, uh, I raised this because, uh, um, and now it's a nice segue to the questions that you have. Uh, uh, what, uh, one of them is uh, right the role of uh, sacrifice, right? Okay. Particularly, ha ha ha. Particularly because I was hoping you'd go there, and and uh, William also mentioned <laughs> sacrifice as well. I mean, it's it's interlaced uh, the notion of the the siege and the the police force, and there's sacrifices and everywhere so yes thank you thank you yeah and uh, that's a exact uh, kind of question that i had in mind when i was uh, back in hong kong uh, two times in back in 2014 to uh kind of as my research trip right a mission to find out what what was going on was it all these kind of uh especially that smashing of the uh, Legislative Building Act. Was that really just a spontaneous act? Was there some kind of uh, strategic consideration actually, or work, any type of organized consideration that's uh, involved in making that decision? And if so, why, right? What are they trying to get with, especially, right, the certain act led to, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, escalation of the crackdown and then ultimate, uh, let's just say, uh, failure in some, at least uh, for, for the most of the protesters back in the 2014, that round of uh, 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 movement. So something interesting for me was that uh, during two trips and for the bulk majority time, and we were, uh, and by the way, for Safi, it was very helpful uh, in setting up and getting the, uh, interviews with uh, people from various sides, especially uh, the student organizers. It's that um, the identity of those uh, group of uh, people that smashed the legislative building remained elusive. And even, right, I talked to my friend, uh, Tom Grundy at the Hong Kong uh, Free Press. And if anyone knows the, you know, the ins and outs of these kind of movement, he will be, right, the person he's at that time already covering, being in Hong Kong for many years, and especially covering the story of the uh, protests. And he didn't have a, a, a good clue neither on who these uh, protests were, the, especially the black clad, the more quote unquote radical ones. And, um, and I asked him if he, I, because at that time, one of the hypotheses I had is, uh, uh, that could that be, you know, installed by security forces, police, right, as a to undermine the the protest. And and interestingly, I found that well, that narrative is very common 
uh, in Western media, this like the most radical ones are probably paid thugs or uh, uh, imposters uh, trying to undermine movement. It's not, uh, dismissed by both the uh, overwhelmingly the student uh, movement leaders, uh, especially the ones I talked to from uh, uh, CUHK, as well as uh, uh, the local journalists. They find that to be not quite plausible, mostly because they say, oh, uh, you can't tell even their uh, masks. They're just not exactly the kind of right type of demographic that will be considered, uh, you know, higher thugs or um, uh, imposters. And so the mystery is thick until really the last day of the 2014, the second uh, research trip, where uh, through a lot of futile attempts at contacting the those self-described most radical groups and mostly based on Hong Kong Golden at that time, the online uh, community, which uh, known in Hong Kong as, well, just think about as part of Reddit, part 4chan, chan, that kind of a, a anonymous uh, uh, board. And myself and my colleague, we tried to contact them with uh, uh, many days when we were in Hong Kong without any uh, success. Uh, until like we received a, a anonymous call in our burner phone, and the guy said uh, he's the spokesperson for the uh, um, the keyboard frontline, which is uh, uh, one of the outlets for the self-proclaimed uh, kind of networked uh, uh, what's it called the uh, uh, crowd-founded, uh, let's just say, uh, journalist outlet that's representing the kind of the more radical wing of the protest. And he claimed, uh, uh, he, he said he's willing to talk to us. And we met in this cafe right next on the Hon University of Hong Kong uh, 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 University campus. And that's where I, uh, in that vi interview, uh, where I have gathered, and this is the results from the interview too, by the way, will be, it's still gone through revisions and will be published uh, in uh, RPA, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, this year, where uh, a few things like from that interview, that was the first time uh, I learned about Bitcoin, ironically. And the guy, one of the first thing, the so-called spokesperson for the keyboard fraud line said to me, he's like, have you heard of Bitcoin? If you haven't heard, it's a good time to invest in Bitcoin right now. And that was the first time I did. And I, I did, I was like, okay. At that time, Bitcoin was extremely cheap. I would just want to learn what the heck it's talking about. I bought one Bitcoin. That turned out to be like the best uh, investment decision I have ever made in my <laughs> entire life. But that being said, uh, from that interview, it became very obvious, at least based on that self, I, don't, I still don't know his identity, he didn't mention anything, but uh, based on the content interview, uh, it's right, he just said he's a law student from Hong Kong, you know, University of Hong Kong, nothing more than that. But what's more interesting was that um, he's a, uh, um, he seems to suggest that the kind of this networked, right, mostly H Hong Kong Golden Forum based uh, group protest, which widely utilizes flash mob technique in, uh, right, uh, suddenly appearing and do something sometimes kind of farcical and other times, right, even probably crossing the line, like the smashing the legislative uh, building uh, kind of act. Uh, Despite the fact that the university student, the organized, uh, uh, let's just say the moderate or the vast majority of the uh, protests, they see the radical wing as just the inevitable, right? When you have a big umbrella movement, uh, part of their own group. And, you know, everyone had the freedom to express themselves. It's just that some of them think their tactic is not most appropriate, but they all think that they're part of the larger movement, the share the goal of like, just say the vast majority of the student protesters. But the, the keyboard frontline guy, he, based on my interview with him, that he did not share 
that reciprocate that kind of uh, thought with the main uh, stream, let's just say, protests. And what remains on a, a I cannot say what's the, definitively their objective, right? Besides the fact that they're a big fan of cryptocurrency and that they are at that time both cynical, extremely cynical over the uh, the state of uh, governmental affair in Hong Kong, both before and after uh, the transfer of sovereignty. And they're extremely cynical, at least based on the guy, the spokesperson, over the general notion of democratic process, that they do not believe that Hong Kong somehow will become a democratic paradise if even if all the demands of the student protesters whenever they are, are met, and they couldn't care less about that. And furthermore, is that um, what they, uh, and seems to be frustrated, uh, is that the guy from the keyboard frontline insists that the whole movement wasn't about democracy. It was hijacked by the university student to become this kumbaya feel good pro-democracy protest. And he claimed it's that their pro, uh, project that hijacked it. For them, it's about digital rights, and they do not see that as a shared. They do not care so much about functional constituency or the basic law. And at least the kid, you know, the self-proclaimed uh, spokesperson, right? Uh, he had a very cynical outlook on this kind of uh, uh, political process at hand, and. Uh, and then the rest of it is just like that's that was the only time I get to, we get to talk face to face with the, you know, the Hong Kong Golden Forum based uh, kind of more radical wing of the uh, movement. And so that story kind of reveals uh, perhaps we, uh, you know, the, also like Larry uh, uh, wrote in the suggested in the uh, book that maybe the protests, uh, the movement is not a as homogenous as like, uh, uh, especially in Western media portray that, right? And B is that uh, it's, uh, there's a mutual, a lot of mutually uh, conflicting, let's just say uh, interest that's both within, right? Uh, Within the uh, well, of course we know there's mutually uh, these kind of uh, fractures and fissures between the movement and the Hong Kong's general population, and between that with the mainland authority. But there's similar kind of this kind of tension that's uh, within the movement, and, and based on these kind of prelim preliminary findings, it's that um, you know it's incredibly difficult to figure out what is the the line that separates between kind of a sacrifice right try to yeah, uh, put yourself out there risking get ar arrested for some kind of a greater cause versus being hijacked right uh, uh, that, that line turned out uh, ended up to become much uh, more uh, much more blurry so and with that being said, too, uh, it's a uh, uh, yeah. Again, that's a very impressive again book. But I would just say that there is a with re regard to the question of sacrifice in the media. There's a lot of different talks about oh, is this movement a kind of a purely organic and. Uh, non-centralized kind of a spontaneous movement versus, oh, there's some kind of like a, a cohesive strategy that's involved. And uh, based on my finding, and I think a lot, you know, based on what I think a lot of it, uh, Larry would uh, agree too, is that it's actually a little bit of, uh, uh, it's a little bit of both, right? In the sense that if we pretend that this movement is one single, movement, like a uh, slap the uh, uh, label, like in Western media called it just like pro-democracy, quote unquote, protest of the 19, 2019 and 2020. And sure, uh, this like a uh, big umbrella, it's a uh, 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 movement, it's a uh, highly fragmented and decentralized and uh, we can argue a lot of it element is spontaneous and it's out of the 
uh, frustration of uh, younger generations uh, of uh, uh, Hong Kong kids, especially. Um, and being a decentralized uh, uh, Big Ten movement like that, that we all to see a lot of kind of uh, behavior, right? Uh, that's uh, questionable, but may not have served a, uh, let's just say, centrally mastermind strategic purpose, like the one perhaps in the, like William mentioned, those uh, sieges that took place in both Hong Kong Baptist and then later on in CU HK, right? But, and then I would say that within the larger movement, I think there is a rather a small but highly if organized and effectively uh, impactful network of activists and whose organization is largely conducted via networked mean, means. Well, in terms of the sheer number, I think they're a tiny, I still believe that they're a very tiny fraction of the larger movement, but their actions so far, I think, have disproportionately influenced both the movement itself and had a tremendous impact on the way the movement is perceived both within Hong Kong, but also between, between the movement and the larger Western media scape, right? And here I'm referring back to the more recent bizarre series of attempt, if you remember in the 2019 ones, we too have these uh, very small flash mobs, right, that appears throughout the movement that somehow they're starting holding up Trump signs, MAGA signs, or seeing American anthems, and it's always a very small group. And, right, that's a very highly organized and particular, and yet this kind of trolling behavior, right, that is uh, uh, seemingly Right, coming out of this very similar playbooks as those flash mobs, the anti-shopper protests that we see from the night 2014. And I would caution that I see a certain right connection in the sense of the sense of the tactic, and I also fear that those uh, smaller and more seemingly right bizarre groups that's highly disruptive outbursts, they might not be as spontaneous A and B. They are kind of a parasite movement within a larger movement that have a very different uh, political objective than the vast majority of the student protesters out there. So, all right, that's getting way too long on the end, but yeah, again, thank you for uh, having me here. And uh, I'm definitely uh, uh, want to hear, right, uh, Larry and the rest of your uh, take on this uh, very interesting uh, uh, developing uh, event that we're seeing now. Thank you. Again, I, I find that what, what you said was actually very interesting and tied really nicely to what William suggested. But let me, you, you pop something in my head that I'm going to throw out at all of you. And it seemed that apparently it's not just the folks in Beijing who've been reading Lenin very carefully, uh, especially what is to be done. But it seems that, in fact, um, what you've described to some extent are Leninist movements. These are digital professional revolutionaries that are looking, you call them parasites, but I'm hearing the Bolsheviks versus the Mensheviks. The, the patterns are very similar, uh, but the context is completely different. And in a way you're suggesting that what we're looking at, even when we look at the physical bodies, these are pieces, and it sounds so horribly cynical, but pieces, but that the field of battle has changed dramatically from uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. And that for people who are at the vanguard of revolution now, whether under the umbrella of democracy or the umbrella of Marxism or whatever else in, in this context is digital rather than anything else. And yet we don't quite yet know what this digital landscape is. We have a sense about it in, with the Bitcoin, but we don't have um, a, a really, that seems to be what, what the future is going to hold. And, and to some extent, we're all sort of part of it. And we're sitting here in a Zoom meeting. Most of us are working and projecting through digital means. Uh, and we have effectively no longer really privilege the traditional methods and modalities of engagement that we all, well, some of us anyway, if you live to be a thousand like me, uh, were grew up in, they're gone. 
um, to some extent, but not yet known. And that may be one of the big doors that have been opened here that we don't know yet what's going to happen, but I suspect that we're all going to play a part. The other two things, and I wondered, I, I want to give William just one second before we go to, to Gao um, to, to maybe talk a little bit about this. The, the two other things that you mentioned that, that were really quite striking, and one of them is disguise. And, and the reason I mentioned this is we talked about this first, the, the, the potential, the disguise, for example, the triads uh, coming in or the disguise uh, regular forces as po in police uniforms or the digital Leninists uh, within the, the protester movement. Uh, we saw this in Cuba as well. There was, uh, my, my sources there were telling me that uh, one of the objects of the government was to because violence has now become the big kicker for international action, uh, that they wanted to foment violence by disguising um, agents of the state within the, the protester movement to actually create the violence that then would justify governmental action. So there's this notion of disguising uh, to cause chaos in both directions. Right, and it is provocation. And then the other thing that, that was coming out, and, and you mentioned this again, is the notion of blood sacrifice in the long term. And so what I'm hearing, for example, in Cuba is that uh, even though they know, and, and I got a sense of this in Hong Kong, certainly after COVID started in January, was the sense that, yeah, we won't win, but our blood, if it is enough and it is shed in a, uh, in a culturally triggering method, our blood will create the foundation for future actions and that this sacrifice is necessary as an initiation, sort of, uh, even though we're not going to win. And so the tactic here isn't necessarily focused. You don't stop. And you mentioned this as well at 2020. 2020 is really, is, it's like those sci-fi movies. Death is not the end. It's a doorway. To, to something greater. And I don't know if, if you've got any uh, comments or reactions to that. And, and if you don't, then we can go right to Gao. Uh, maybe I can just have one minute and then I'll go to Gao because uh, I, I just want to say on that issue of um, provocateurs or, or disguise. Um, I mean, I think in, in the 2019 protests, there was a lot of talk about that. Um, especially initially, roughly from late June to July, when the protests started to go from being um, almost overwhelmingly peaceful to being more um, confrontational with sporadic bouts of violence. And I remember at the time, there were a lot of talks, like, I, you know, people, if there was an egregious thing of violence on the protesters' side, there was a, almost always a push to say, oh, that must have been the police. Um, and I, I think I was fairly unconvinced. Uh, I think most other people in the know were unconvinced. But with that said, I do, it's my belief, although I can't prove it, that the siege of Legco, which happened on July 1st, um, they made a deliberate choice not to protect Legco, thinking that there would be a backlash from Hong Kong society. Um, and I mean, this is just a theory, so I don't want to go too far out there, but I think you, there is video of the police running away. They had the forces, They and I, I have some insider info on that to protect it, but, but I think that that was a miscalculation as well by the central authorities to think that that type of violence against the alleged code would trigger a, a backlash in public, Hong Kong public opinion. So, um, yeah, I mean, overall, I don't believe in the, the provocateurs or the foreign hands, which is another um, mem which we could get into, which, you know, if you look at CCTV documentary sense, they heavily play up the foreign, this is a foreign backed color, color revolution um, for both 2014 and 2019, which I think is a complete misreading of the situation. I mean, it's akin to Trump thinking, or some people thinking that uh, the siege of, you know, um, was actually, you know, the, the, the January 6th was actually BLM, you know, it's kind of a, a nutty conspiracy theory, but, um, you know, you could point to statements made by Pompeo and whatnot to, to piece it together and say it's in the U.S. interests. So anyway, I don't, I, go, go ahead. I don't want to talk anymore. All right, but, but and, and the interesting last point, William, because that's precisely what was at the heart 
of the Cuban president's speech as well in response to the, um, the protests in Cuba as well. There was the, the black hand of foreign interference. Um, he didn't use the Chinese terms. He might as well have. Um, and, and that, in fact, that this is all uh, not a CIA plot, but the ongoing uh, revolutionary activities of the United States to uh, to overthrow or destabilize the, the current political economic order. Uh, and but it's very useful. It's, 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 you know, it's a temptation, I think, that a state would be foolish not to look at uh, in the context of its own conversations, especially within its polity. Um, and, and certainly it has uh, extraordinarily powerful ramifications, if only to throw smoke uh, in their uh, discussions with the community of nations. But I'll leave that, and, and, and I have no opinion one way or another other than what was in the book with respect to the, the whole black hand notion uh, in, in the Hong Kong situation, other than to suggest it was an extraordinarily powerful rich and historically embedded trope. And, and to some extent, uh, the, the state got a tremendous amount of uh, leverage from it, uh, whether it's quote unquote true or not. And, and that's sort of where I'm going in the book. It almost, whether it's true or not is an interesting question for PhDs whether it proved useful in creating the meaning necessary to further objectives becomes a more interesting question. Um, and so meaning, uh, meaning gets detached from quote unquote truth in ways here that, that occurs throughout Hong Kong and now in, in what's going on in Cuba as well, uh, in ways that, that are extraordinarily fascinating. All right, but anyway, Gao, what you got for us? Oh, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this event. It's so exciting to hear everyone's insightful opinions. And uh, I have to say, I echo a lot with what Karen and uh, William just uh, explained it. And I can't wait to hear the rest of you guys uh, about this. Um, so I have to say, I totally agree with Curran that of something really struck me when I read this book is how it fabulously chronological all the event from the start to most current one. It feels like a trilogy, but unlike the most spectacular trilogies that the event itself is spectacular in various ways. However, the angles and uh, the language and uh, analysis is very objective and uh, pure. And uh, like Curran said, you do not have so many different heavily seasoned material here. You are very, very objective. And I really like that. And it gives me a chance to see the things in a more neutral tone so I can observe and develop my own thinkings. And uh, to also uh, echo back to what Curran and William just explained it is that I feel like there is this this mirroring happening around the globe if you look for the past decades and you realize how similar it went and a similar movement happening in different continent. I would just say it feels like there was some kind of action that is so contagious and it's a passionate, it's aggressive, and it's sometimes extremely high visibility with a sense of reckless. And uh, people is trying through those actions and a movement to reaffirm and reaffirm what they believe. It's like a virtual signaling. And uh, everyone is not directly say it, but it is very implied as that uh, how social media or how this digital being is implemented through this network and we are doing all kinds of things trying to reaffirm, re-justify what we believe in this movement. And I find that's uh, interesting factors. And, uh, and uh, to just uh, for my reading of the book, this is very short that indeed, I find something really interesting at the end of the book is you talk about 
um, the endless self-destructive critiques happening in the world, in the West. And I found that's really interesting because I agree with that. And indeed the West is underlying some endless and self-destructive critic conceptually and physically. And I say that as a resident of Minneapolis and everyone knows what happened in the past year, I'm witnessing the physical and the emotional trauma of this process in the cheering and yelling from different side. And one observation for me very interesting is how the locals, the angles from the locals and the angle from the national medias, scholars, analysis, strategics, they are having conflict of uh, ideas about what's going on. And this is also in a very natural way that what you have from the national, from the outsiders, they are interpreted things for their own objective, for their own interest. And we do not talk enough about the human cost in this process. And like a current said, a sacrifice. And I'm witnessing this kind of physical and emotional trauma that is suffering by the locals. And uh, nobody actually, the national is talking event in a way, portraying in an event with a lot of seasoning, a lot of flair, and presented in a very, very much, almost as if entertaining ways. And we are witnessing in this, not just for the tragedy here in Minneapolis, but also tragedy happening in a lot of other places, the languages, the camera angle, even the music background. I vividly remember how how the US TV, like CNN or Fox News, they use this triumphal like music background when they report in breaking news or tragic news. It feels like the audience is part of this production of a human event. And I feel there is some questions about the ethics. There's some questions about the uh, uh, integrities in how we interact as a society in this process. And Hong Kong, back to Hong Kong, I feel like Hong Kong is an extension of some form of West. It is like in between or on the different historical, cultural or economic universe. And now, like you precisely point out in your book, Hong Kong is gradually pulled back to the heartland. And this identity of in-betweener, I believe, is still staying there. And although right now this in-betweeners is going to be a different form of political or ideological dimensions. So I think every all the discussion is very interesting. And I realize how the social media is accelerating and exhilarating people's emotions, passions, or become a reckless. And uh, it's very interesting to see where it goes, but also very unfortunately to see the human cost and the reckless as a result from it. So that's my very short uh, response and uh, comments about what we just uh, experienced. So I give back time to everyone. Thank you. All right, well, well Gal, you, you've raised two, at least two really interesting point. So I want I um, uh, to, to ask you a little bit more about that. And maybe uh, Karen and, and Matthew and William can chime in as well. Um, so one of the questions, and I'm going to start with the last point you made. It's social media. This is social media and, and mass movement. Um, and you, you put something in my head, which is a very dangerous thing to do, I think. You put something in my head, just like Karen started talking about the, the Leninist uh, digital professional revolutionaries, you're talking to me about now social media and mass movements. And I'm wondering whether, in fact, is it possible to look at Hong Kong and, in effect, to look at uh, what's going on in Cuba as well, not putting the, the protests that occurred before, it's before the digital revolution of the kind that we're witnessing now, really in its, in its formative and pristine form. These are, um, oh, they're made for TV interactive movies that are designed where the action on the ground isn't really the important 
important element. It is the action that is occurring in digital space that becomes the key, the reactions by people. Now, we don't have the likes or the not likes. We don't have people being voted off the island. But the question really is, is this, is it, are we now moving to, and is it more interesting to understand this as a digital event where it has its more profound change than as events that actually occur on the ground, which are really, that have been decentered from what, what appears to be going on. So that's, that's my first question to you. And then I got- oh, I have I have uh, two response to your uh, two steps for your uh, first question. So I think the first one is that, I think this is very interesting. We going back to uh, at one dimension, one way to look at this is whether the techniques, we are questioning about the techniques of the movement. So this is linked to a situation that where you have a protest from the local communities that how they behave and interact, deploy different strategies to maximize their um, pursuit, their goals. And then there's an other factors from the outside, which we are talking, for example, like a national community or international community, how they engage in the event happening. So this is uh, one way to look at it is the techniques involved with this, is that uh, whether there is local community behave or enact or strategy in a way that in a, they interpret this wrong or they did this wrong because the international communities or the outsider or national, they are the audience. So they are engaged in this in a safe lens way and they are engaging in like a virtual signaling. They are affirming their values. I'm not saying this is bad, and it is very dangerous to say uh, the local community is some kind of performer artist trying to do something. That is not a true. Um, what I'm saying here is that um, in this process that what the local communities did, they are out of their control because like language, like words, when you are speaking, what you mean is not what others received. And when you say it out or speak out, it's out of your own control. It's out of your own domains. And the outsider will interpret it the way they want it to. So there is a gap and uh, how to fulfill that gap to make sure you go is reach out. That's a strategic, that's a technical questions. Another way to look at this, which is something I question, I think I'm presenting to everyone here is from political perspective on a higher dimension is that, is there any, because I'm reading all the questions from the list and does it actually imply there is actually something the local community can do to reach some level of goals they meet. However, when we are actually witnessing a process of the China is going to expand its political uh, socialist development program, and we are witnessing this OBOR and Hong Kong or the pandemic is providing a historical opportunity for China to strategically and pragmatically to leverage what they want engaging with the West or engaging with the world to fortify its national interest. So I think that there were two ways to look at it. One, to summarize, one is to say, okay, we can in the microscopic look at it, is there a technical perspective the local community can do to maximize their objective? And the second is actually from a higher point, is those goals or objective realistic when we are seeing a historical trend that is not going to that way anymore? So that is my reaction to your first question. <laughs> Oh, the, the reason I ask is, is, as you were talking, and 
like as the three of you were telling, this is again something that's popped into my head. When you look at what's going on in Hong Kong, and and you can really see it in Cuba, which and and there in Hong Kong, it was slow, and the lessons appeared to be learned. It was almost instantaneous in Cuba. You really have a debate or a question about or a fight for control over three centering node, three centering nodes. Where is interest or what what is driving what is at the center of things and in these contexts there's three of them one is a person being filmed whether it is the representative of the hong kong and macau affairs office or the people on the street the object that is producing stuff is that the person who's filming who by the choices of what is filmed and what is not what is edited what is not what is placed and where and what is not effectively recreates or creates the meaning, the reality, which, which is then the thing that's recorded and real. So you've got the person who's actually producing it, you've got the person who's filming, and then the person who's watching, right? And so the question is, when you look at a context like a, a, a proto-revolutionary or a proto-transformative engagement context like Hong Kong or like Cuba, you now all of a sudden I'm asking myself, and I didn't at the time because you know we were in this, but now it's it's becoming I think far more relevant and important. Which of these three centers, which of these three actors really is is at the center of? Um, and now I'm going to do this from a Leninist perspective. Which of these three is actually the vanguard? which is the leading force, which is driving this, and against which and how do you react when in fact you can divide this into three quite distinct, each of them having their own sub-universe of objectives and stuff, but three quite distinct elements that then make up a totality, the, the uh, alignments of which then kind of will move you forward, right? The, the person being filmed, the filming and the watching, and they all aware of each other. Right, and so in Hong Kong, it, it, if, if I look back on it now, um, I have this sense that you, you've got this very, by the end, a bit of self-consciousness between those who are being filmed and maybe are aware of it, right? It's the, the film star, don't shoot this side of me. My profile is better than my front. Um, and I want to be put in a position in a place where I will be filmed. And then I have to have some manage at least a little bit of control about being filmed. The person who's filming, are, are you interesting enough to be filmed? Do I have the capacity to leverage this film into something? And am I, by my choosing, now transforming you into whatever it is that I edit uh, and distribute? And then the people who are watching, right? Amnesty in Hong Kong didn't orchestrate the people on the street. They didn't film, just that, let's just assume they received the stuff, yet their reception plays a vital role in its transformation in meaning. And so the, or the, the, uh, the folks, uh, the central authorities in, uh, in China or Mr. Pompeo uh, sitting in Washington. And then the question is that interaction, but now all of a sudden you've changed the entire analytical framework from a Leninist or from a, trans, a revolutionary transformative perspective, you've changed entirely both the analysis, the strategies and the tactics with which you approach these kind of quote unquote mass engagements with power um, in, in a way that you wouldn't have been able to do uh, before 2019. And, and to some extent, it probably would be useful, now that I finish this, I can go back and mine this, uh, is to figure out how all of this is actually panning out and, and what appears to be the lessons that actors, not academics like us that sit far away, but actors are, are learning from this and then processing. But anyway, that-, well, that well, it, While the means are different, I would question how new it is. Um, I mean, we can even look at the civil rights revolution in America and say there was a production in the protests themselves uh, that were uh, filmed, edited, and disseminated out on nightly television to get the reaction of those in their living rooms that watched the nightly news every day with the hopes of maybe changing some minds, changing some hearts, and changing some sides. 
Uh, so I, I don't know how new that is particularly, but I know the means by which it is being used today is new. The production side, you had to find someone who was charismatic enough and drew the ca cameras enough to lead you. And I think for me personally, while reading this book, I, I felt like looking at the miscalculations was my biggest um, takeaway. So I, I'll start off by saying, I read this book like a tragedy in many ways because the hindsight is 2020 and I'm living past it, or not really past it, but I'm living past the writing of the book. So you can keep looking back and say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I remember as a child, we watched this uh, show called uh, My Friend Martin. And around first or second grade, all the kids in the class knew Martin died, Martin was shot. And in the movie, he goes out on the balcony. And so around first or second grade, the kids start saying, no, don't go on the balcony, Mark. It's inevitable that he's gonna go on the balcony. And that is in a way how I read um, this book when you see the miscalculations. Coming into this uh, meeting, I thought to myself, yeah, the protest was made miscalculations. Yes, the international community's made miscalculations. But to me personally, I will, it was hard pressed to find a, a miscalculation by the central government uh, on their side. And as we've been doing this interview and looking at Cuba, I think using the discourse of the black hand or um, the external factors that are driving the protest, I think that that is an eventual miscalculation that some of these countries are using because of the overuse of this tactic may lead to a desensitization of the population mm -hmm so that they will no longer really trust that it is an outside force that is leading um, the opposition groups. And eventually, it may open up the opportunity for that type of use to be, uh, uh, to be had or that practice to be used because they may no longer believe it. Uh, so if you look at the miscalculations, I agree um, fully with uh, Mr. Nee about the organization of the protests. I think that was something that throughout the book, you sit there and you realize maybe there should be some better organization by these, uh, by the protest umbrella. And relatively speaking, you don't see that in the book, but that's how I read the book. I just want to point that out. I read it more so as a hindsight tragedy where I was saying, no, don't do that. Don't do it. It's not gonna work out the way you think, so. Okay. Um, or Gal, you to, want react, to, to react to or don't do get, people will do that. We look at the 2020 pandemic, what happened in Wuhan. I'm from Wuhan, so I know what happened in Wuhan. And it repeated again, not only in the, in the last third world, but also US in the Europe. So I don't know, I become cynical on this. <laughs> But, but, but you've opened you've opened a door. So here I'm going to ask, <laughs> and we, this is nothing but a series of sensitive questions. So I'm going to ask a sensitive question, but you can reply to it sensitively, right? Was it? This is now you you've opened up the miscalculation door. Was it a mistake for key the the poster children of the protest movement? Was it a mistake for them to be flying off to Washington or to be seen? constantly in the uh, buildings or in the company of the uh, American diplomatic staff? Did that not just provide the meat necessary for the central authorities to then just prepare? Um, might they have done this some other way? And then a related question, and this will get back to, to William too, and that is the connection between the protester movement and the extraordinarily rich and, um, and, and quite important non-governmental organization community in Hong Kong during the time, miscalculations there. So that's my questions uh, to throw out to you. Matthew, take a shot at it. I, well, I... I think that's a very good question. And I think it's an easy answer to that question too, is uh, whether it's a sensitive, I mean, whether it's a sensitive or not, it depends on whose miscalculation is, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might be miscalculation for some, assuming we know who that sound is, but it's definitely not a miscalculation and it's definitely did a lot of folks a good favor what they did. 
So that is my answer to that miscalculation questions. And Matthew can comment furthermore. Matthew, William. <laughs> I, I actually totally agree with you on that. I think whose miscalculation it is. It, you know, there are some times where you're in a, and I'm not putting this on the protesters that they were in a lose-lose situation, but sometimes you can have all the right calculations and it will still be turned on you in a situation in which you just cannot win. And so uh, to say it was a miscalculation would be to say, I know of a better option or an alternative for their actions. And, and I can't say that honestly right at this moment. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't really think I can say that it was. Yeah, uh, I would I would kind of agree with that. Um, it's very difficult to blame people who, uh, you know, had very few points of leverage in a, in a way. Um, you know, there, there's a Chinese idiom like "chen lu qi qiong," which is like, you know, the the poor donkey doesn't have that many uh, tactics to its, its hand. And I I kind of feel like the Hong Kong protesters were like that. And so it's almost I feel like. Most people in Hong Kong felt that way. And so there was a, a reluctance to, to kind of criticize their tactics or miscalculations. Um, I would say that one interesting thing, just in the big scheme of things, when I was living in Hong Kong is that the pro-democracy camp for most of it, um, you know, if you go back to Tsetso Wa or, you know, people like um, Lee Chuck Yen, you know, who kind of had this more patriotic than the CCP, type of thing where, you know, in the 70s, they were protesting against, you know, Japanese incursions and, uh, you know, they were always supporting human rights defenders and the Tiananmen vigil. And I think the younger generation of Hong Kongers, um, you know, kind of got disillusioned with that, uh, the old seafood generation, kind of that old, old fashioned um, kind of patriotic Chinese-ness. Um, so there's kind of that generational shift, but meeting U.S. foreign officials, I mean, I think that that definitely could have been um, a miscalculation, but it kind of goes to the, the issue that came up earlier about the flying American flags and whatnot, is that was strategically timed, as far as I understand, to coincide with votes and debates on that legislation. And if you actually look at the media pickup in the U.S. press about Hong Kong, it goes up dramatically when there's the US flags. So from a tactical point of view, I think that that wasn't a miscalculation is the protesters were very strategic uh, in trying to say, okay, we know that the US press isn't paying that much attention. Let's all fly American flags and push this legislation over the finish line. Um, to go back to miscalculations by the central authorities, I think the biggest one is going back to 2014 in the white paper and kind of the framing of, of Hong Kong issues and not, at the time in 2014, there were many people, inc including on the pro-democracy side, who were trying to give a way forward for um, democratic reform in Hong Kong that would have been acceptable to the central authorities. But then the white paper kind of um, gave a big middle finger to that, um, to, to use academic jargon. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and then during the protests itself, you know, the protesters, there wasn't really a Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong nationalist sentiment to the 2014 protests in many ways. Um, and the Hong Kong protesters, act, the, the, the least student leaders actually tried to fly to Beijing, if we remember, to dialogue with the authorities. Um, so if you think of it, pull back and say, they consider themselves part of the political community of Chinese people, and we're trying to dialogue with the authorities about democracy. And they were stopped and this is the big, big mistake, I think, is then there were many of them were blacklisted, probably thousands of the people who were um, arrested in 2014 were, were no longer able to travel to the mainland. And so from that point of view, imagine yourself being a 20, 20 year old, you know, you've just been blacklisted, you know, you'll never be hired by a, a Chinese SOE or Chinese bankers, which are taking over the city. What are you going to do? I mean, and the only thing left is really kind of a much more Hong Kong nationalist orientation. Um, so I think that that um, lack of conceding, you know, and, and if you have to think of and people in Hong Kong, you know, people are buying apartment. I mean, it's been a thing to dismiss the socioeconomic complaints, but, you know, 
it costs almost a, a million US dollars to buy a 350 foot square house home. I mean, that's the size of a half a garage in the US. Um, but this is the kind of the quality of life that I think young Hong Kongers cannot even view themselves having. So I think the central authorities had a series of miscalculations over the course of about six or seven years and viewing the honk, the, the, the mis, misjudging, um, the foreign element, the, the motivations of Hong Kong protesters and projecting their national narrative of the 18th night, you know, the opium wars and foreign aggression, their kind of meta narrative of the state onto the Hong Kong protests. Um, and then finally to the point of NGOs, um, you know, I don't think one of the, <laughs> I, I think that I don't think that major NGOs um, that worked on this um, had um, major issues in terms of their reporting. I mean, I think the reporting was all very accurate, very comprehensive. You can take it to the bank that it's factual. If there's a problem, I would say I would criticize human rights law in the sense that, um, you know, from the point of view of Amnesty International, we can look at the uh, the human rights obligations of the state um, that they have voluntarily taken on, such as, um, you know, I, they have to abide by the ICCPR, and then they have the basic law and various um, provisions under that. And we have things on from international human rights standards that we can assess in terms of the policing of protests. And if the state, meaning the police, does not um, abide by those, uh, their obligations, then we make our criticism of them. And that, that is kind of the basis of everything we do, whether it's you know Amnesty International at the same time, well, in 2020, had a very good report about the overuse of force in the Black Lives Matter protests, um, which is based on the same, same line of thinking and, and around the world, we have similar reports. We don't really have any capacity to have a political diagnosis of you know, um, you know, shooting arrows at police is not very wise people, you know, we, we don't really have any, I mean, we can say that the police needs to protect the right to life of people, um, but we don't really, we can't really get at that political dimensions um, to have the political arguments about what is the best way forward with community. And I, I think some of the tragedy of 2019 is, I mean, Carrie Lam was, I think, one of the worst politicians I've ever seen in my life in that if she had had humanity, if she had had the Bill Clinton sense to say, I feel your pain people, you know, and just, just she could have potentially, I mean, maybe not, but she could have potentially taken the situation and de-escalated it in June of 2019, but she didn't, um, none of the pro-establishment people did, um, or really, really took a risk. And then I think, you know, in the pro-democracy side, um, there's also potentially criticism for the lack of leadership and denouncing some of the more extreme and unproductive uh, tactics. Um, but yeah, so I think that there's miscalculations um, politically. I wish NGOs had a capacity to, to, to have more of a political argument, but um, that's, you know, I don't think that we've ever seen that as our mandate. We've just seen the mandate as are, is the state um, abiding by its human rights obligations? Um, and that's kind of where a human rights organization should be. And the manner in which people protest, the content of which they're protesting and their grievances isn't really something that we should agree with or not agree with. Um, and, you know, we just have to say that they have the right to protest or the right to freedom of expression. We don't actually say what the content of that expression should be. Um, so that's kind of the limitations. I wouldn't say it's a mistake. It's really the limitations of the human rights methodology in, in terms of uh, looking at a protest movement or social movement. Thanks. Okay. So I've got, I've got a question. William, William has now just energized me uh, in a way that I had not thought of before. So here's a question for all of you. And it goes back to the second question I was going to ask Gao and, and hopefully Karen and, and Matthew can also uh, uh, give their views here. But this, again, very sensitive or, or provocative, but, but here it is. Um, the question I was going to go to was 
uh, the the failure, and I argue in the book, although uh, subtly, the the utter failure and collapse of a particular way of looking at the role and importance of international law as directly um, uh, central to constraining actions, especially governmental actions. But in that in that process, uh, so here's my question. Um, and given what, what William said, actually starting from the, the umbrella movement going forward, was the West and the people of, and I'm going to put it in the most brutal and in cynical way possible, was the West and the, the people of Hong Kong played by the central authorities in a brilliant, brilliant way. And they were played in this way. There is, it would have been impossible before 2047 uh, given the climate before 2019 or 2014 um, uh, or 2013, actually, it would have been impossible for the central authorities to uh, fast forward the sinification of Hong Kong to the point where they wanted it, both deeply embedded within the uh, Pearl River Delta megacity, uh, deeply embed embedded within at least the core uh, uh, Leninist notions, uh, Marxist-Leninist notions that guide the rest of the country, and as a significant component, a uh, national component uh, that's critical for its outbound expression through Belt and Road. It would have been impossible to do this, but for a provocation, and that indeed a half a decade of provocation, which then produces this explosion, was precisely the kind of thing that the central authorities needed in order to then react in ways that would have been much less acceptable or for which they would have paid a much higher political price in the international community, but for the protest. So that actually the protest made it possible for the, the central authorities to move forward their ultimate plans for Hong Kong uh, forward by, uh, by several decades. And that in the process, the West has played, and to some extent, the protesters themselves. Yeah, I, I, think, I think your second question is actually a um, response to some of what I just said, a second point, the second way of the looking at this is, I'm feeling like there is, something in the horizon right now. Uh, I don't know, whatever that is, but it's something is on the horizon. And uh, looking back for the past decade, there is um, very careful planning of how the China is strategically um, building its own approach to the next generations or the new era of uh, international rule making or international rule system for its own national interest. And uh, I think China overall did very good um, in terms of how they thinking in its way for what they want to do. Um, and uh, I'm not talking this in a very micro implementation level. They were allowed to talk about from economic, from political, from whatever angles you can criticize it. And some of them are quite scientific and objective, but overall the thinking is China is going that path and reaching um, in what they want to do. And, and you are witnessing this that Hong Kong is going back to the heartland and we will see what's the next chapter going to be. And of course there will be, it won't be smooth, but it's a slightly like going to that mission. We can always argue whether we reach this particular milestone or not, but the mission is already established and it's on its way going to that mission. And uh, your, your comments is actually particularly pinpointed to the miscalculation or we could say miscalculation of the international society or miscalculation of the West, how they see this, how they look at this. And in some way, I think there is some truth in that because uh, as you can see, China is doing uh, different things that trying to strategize it itself in a way that to um, engaging in itself to build a new economic model, to build a new trade model, to build a new technology 
and uh, to build a new trade relation. All this, they build new things is to in order to preserve its own political objective, political ideology and a political system. And uh, in that approach, I think what they did is, is working for what they want. So that is my overall general response to that. And uh, I think the West uh, has not put itself in the mode to think about this. <laughs> okay, okay, I give time back to others. <clears throat> well, uh, one thing I'll say is um, in one of your chapters, you describe a different way. There were uh, two parallel, parallel ways of looking at the way history could be written. And while you may be able to sit there and see this is or ask question whether or not the protesters in the international community got played, yes, that is a way, a viewpoint to look at it. But also, I mean, it's just as easy to look at it and say, in a way, maybe China got played. China just, I mean, the central government just fought and uh, strategically battled over land, which technically speaking, belonged to them already. And if you have a sense of victory in this moment, you, you, you've won almost nothing. You've won what was already technically yours. So I, I think that those are two different ways to look at it and two different ways to portray it. William Curran. Uh, so with regard to the question of uh, played, I think, uh, 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 so, there's a, <clears throat> something that's very different. Uh, one element that's very different between the 2014 and 2019 iterations of this these protests. Uh, I do tend to believe that uh, back in 2014, the central authority was quite dumbfounded in what's going on and just tried to figure out, right, uh, what you know, both central authority and the <laughs> uh, uh, right Hong, Hong Kong. Uh, it's first away. <laughs> yeah, but uh, something different in the 19, 2019 iterations, I do remember uh, I was back in, uh, in China. Well, you know, not luckily, I uh, right before COVID, so I didn't get stuck there. But I did notice that uh, back in, uh, uh, you know, I was back there in uh, early 2019 and uh, the mainland news media, both online and on TV, they were reporting on the protests in Hong Kong quite heavily. And this is where it gets, because you know how, well, really I would definitely know, right? <laughs> Something that's really serious and uh, uh, will not really see the light of the day in the, uh, uh, especially when it comes to protests uh, uh, in, in mainland media. So immediately I, you know, that simple fact has suggested in 2019, the fact that uh, the mainland medias are happily kind of reporting on what's going on in Hong Kong is that the, at least the central authority thought in the 2019 round that the what's happening uh, this time around, it's uh, in their favor in a way that they can comfortably report that without much worry. Uh, so at least whether or not it's there's like a overt mechanism or conspiracy uh, involved in shaping the movement in a way that's in the mainland favor I, I i i sort of doubt it i think i don't think they're competent enough to do that fifth dimensional chess game it's a large organization and you get a mixed bag of people Right, and it's only as competent as the least competent person of the group. I mean, uh, but it's just that I think uh, in the 2019 um, protest, it's just the way the protests are unfolded in Taiwan, uh, uh, sorry, not Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong itself has made it very convenient for, more convenient so than 2014 for uh, the central authority to use it in its own interest. I weigh in, Larry. Um, I mean, I think the, the the question of did the West get played is a very interesting question. I mean, um, in some ways, I, I kind of think maybe yes, a little bit, but 
Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm tempted to, to dispute the premise of the question and say the West was never a player in this. Um, for the most part, I remember going to meetings, you know, with uh, State Department people and whatnot in like 2012 or 2013. And Hong Kong really wasn't a concern at all. I mean, I, I don't think they cared at all. I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, what is the American view on Belize or something? I mean, it's just, you yeah, know, it's... Um, so I, I think I think there there wasn't even enough attention there to get played. Um, I mean, maybe it's different for the UK, but um, I would say that in 2019, a lot more of the concerns about Hong Kong were related to larger questions about China, um, not a, really about Hong Kong in and of itself. I mean, with, with maybe some exceptions. Um, so there's that, but I think I like Matthew's point about did the main man get played in the sense that it's already, Hong Kong was already theirs. There was never a risk that even the worst demonstrators were ever going to gain political power or that with their umbrellas and bows and arrows that they could uh, have any real danger to national security. I mean, in some ways. Um, and yet by kind of going after Hong Kong in a very draconian fashion with the NSL, um, you know, that was, has played a factor in sinking, for example, the trade deal with Europe, um, along with the Wolf Warrior diplomacy. Whereas, you know, you know, I was in conversations a year ago where it looked like China was going to very successfully uh, wedge apart Europe from the US. Um, and, you know, the, if, if China's rise is going to be constrained by the US, just purely, you know, looking at it very cynically, um, the U.S. has to have a coalition of, of like-minded countries. And to the extent that China really shows its ugly side, um, you know, which it did, I think, in Hong Kong and, and showed the most draconian side of itself, I, rather than letting Hong Kong kind of flourish um, and allowing democracy as it did kind of in the Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao era to some extent, Wen Jiabao era then, um, you know, I think that this is, has, has not been good um, for the mainland. So maybe, maybe it is true that they, they got played um, to some extent. So I don't know. It's it. I mean, I'm sure you can debate back and forth. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I just never know to what extent the West was a major player um, in, in the protests. Uh, it's something that I know if you look at the mainland, reporting, they believe that was huge, but um, I, I don't think it was. But one other thing on the mainland reporting, I think it's interesting to note that um, in June, the, the reporting on Hong Kong was relatively minimal. I mean, if you look at the China Media Project that has a tracker of all the different newspapers and along with like CCTV, there's very minimal coverage with some exceptions of like the Global Times who you know, has a readership that's more into international affairs. Um, but I, I think that once you had the LegCo break in, the siege on the LegCo, and then taking over the airport, that really forced the mainland's hand because then you know, when you have hundreds of flights per day going to and from uh, Hong Kong and all those passengers can't go, you can't really sweep that under the rug with the broader population anymore. Um, and you really had to, have an explanation to the broader public. And then of course they made it seem like a, a kind of a cons con Western led color revolution that they had to put down. Um, and that was the framing, if you looked on Weibo, going back to the social media thing, where you could see clip after clip after clip of protester violence, and then go on to Twitter and see clip after clip after clip of the police just beating the crap out of people unnecessarily. So that, you know, you definitely had different um, narratives, different framings on social media. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there, thanks. Right. Well, what about, this, these are all excellent points. So in, in terms of being played, um, one of the, the stories that had been circulating at the time was that the reason that, um, that China may have from the Western perspective overplayed its hand was what I what I call the the virus theory, and since we're in COVID, and and COVID was so pivotal to to the way this all ultimately ended, that we'll we'll use the the virus metaphor. That uh, the problem with Hong Kong wasn't that uh, it was a particularly 
uh, territorial threat in terms of what it can do. The problem was that the idea of the people of Hong Kong engaging with the state in a particular way might itself be viewed as a virus, which if it infects um, Sichuan, if it infects uh, uh, Xi'an, if it infects Shanghai, oh, whoa, then all of a sudden you've got a problem. And so the, the idea was that Hong Kong became overblown in importance uh, precisely because they needed to cauterize this before it corrupted the rest of the Chinese body politic. And therefore, from the Chinese perspective, it wasn't an overreaction at all. It was a very resounding um, lesson or signal to the rest of the country that no, if you're even thinking about um, becoming unique the way Hong Kong is. We are willing to sacrifice Hong Kong's uniqueness. We are willing to sacrifice the agreements that we entered into with the international community. We are willing to reframe international law. We are willing to jettison the conversations we had with the Europeans about the European model of, of fractured sovereignty, You know the, the model of Spain and Catalonia the idea of being able to keep a country united but have a fractured sovereignty. We're willing to give all of that up because if we fail to do that, then the next thing you know is that the people of, uh, and I'm not going to say Xinjiang, I'm going to say the people of Xi'an or Shanghai are going to demand the same thing on the basis of, of their own traditional customs and, and whatever. Is there something to that? I could answer that real quick. I mean, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, at the, in June of 2019, the, the, the five demands were all very reasonable uh, things that people um, in, whether it's Xi'an or, or, or Sichuan or wherever, could all ask for. And so I think that there was that, um, they didn't want that type of um, politics to, to go national. And I think you can look at 2014, Amnesty at the time, documented uh, at least 50 or so um, human rights defenders that were uh, detained, many of them sentenced for long sentences, people like Xie Wenfei or Su Changlan for, for, uh, for supporting the 2014 protests. In 2019, you had people like um, human rights lawyer Chen Chiu Shi who flew down to do independent reporting. And he had like, a, I think a, a few hundred thousand um, followers on Weibo and a lot of Twitter followers to do his own independent reporting to see what was really going on. And he was subsequently detained. Uh, you know, so you, you definitely had a, a huge, um, the censorship apparatus and the police definitely tried to stop independent reporting from kind of pro-democracy people in China to see what was happening in Hong Kong, to stop any sympathetic coverage and kind of only have coverage that, that basically the state could, could control. Um, yes, I also kind of had a, on this uh, point, uh, uh, concur on the uh, fact that I think uh, um, a lot of the uh, strategic considerations uh, from mainland uh, uh, and uh, made on Hong Kong. It's not necessarily made on the basis of oh, international affairs, per se, um, but rather uh, domestic concerts. And one of the biggest uh, talking point that is uh, seldomly discussed in uh, Western media or any media outside China is uh, uh, at least uh, whether it's the comparison is accurate or not, but certainly uh, among the right the mainland authority when the student protests in Hong Kong showed up, uh, a bus were kept bringing up that's the um, you know eighty six movement, which is in Chinese, which uh, again this is a huge event in in China's history, but I think in the West often. <laughs> Uh, eclipsed the 1989 Tiananmen uh, uh, Square protests. Uh, it's often for, right, overlooked. But in the 1986, uh, uh, what happened started in the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, 
University of Science and Technology in Anhui province, and a few thousand students uh, started, you know, protesting on the street over what they see as the NPC uh, election, local election, right? That's not national, but just local uh, in Hefei, city of Hefei, the students were angry that the uh, elections are not based on, you know, provisions of the constitution, which was newly minted back then, the 1983 constitution. And they were very unhappy and demanding electoral reforms. Basically, they want, right, genuine, you know, multi-candidate party when uh, uh, candidates, uh, as stipulated in the constitution, when doing base, at least local level NPC uh, elections. But very quickly, that 80, uh, the protest, student protest in Hefei city caught on. And then very quickly after, you know, students in universities in uh, Shanghai, Hubei, Jiangsu, even as far as Heilongjiang, they all start protesting their local election laws. And that actually the, uh, uh, in China known as 86 movement, that costed the actual uh, uh, downfall of Hu Yaobang, the uh, party uh, secretary, because uh, you know the CPC elders saw Hu Yaobang as the person that blamed him responsible essentially for the student movement because they, he was the guy that's uh, uh, pushing for the electoral law reform. And so when the uh, Hong Kong, especially the fact that it was heavily organized by university student, and it was heavily revolving around the uh, uh, election, local election, uh, immediately within the mainland authority, right? It, this uh, automatic uh, trigger, literal trigger, uh, remind them of the 1986 movement, which that also is the movement that catalyzed the later on 1989 Tiananmen protests. And so a lot of the reactions and decisions and uh, in response to, uh, from the mainland side, in response to uh, Hong Kong, right, it isn't really international affair minded, but they don't want uh, what they see as 86, 86 student movement flaring up again in a 2019 version. So, yeah, so that's, you know, something that's, I think, widely uh, overlooked outside of China. Interestingly, I noticed. Um, to add to Karen's uh, comments, and uh, I also want to say that it's a very interesting timing around the uh, 2014-ish time, and uh, that was a time there was a discourse in China in the leadership among leadership is to the discourse is about the fall of the Soviet Union. specifically in the late 80s. So uh, I think this is um, overall the discussions is um, comes back to the how the rulers in China is doing from their toolkit to build a new economy, to build a new trade relationship like OBOR and negotiate new trade deals. Everything they do is even build a new technology they conduct their international business for their national interest and for the national interest to preserve their political agenda and the political ideology and the political objectives. So that's the frame and that's the uh, approach they take. And so it's not a surprise to see how they react to the event unfold from 2014. And uh, so, that is my questions from the very beginning. That is the second way to see this is from the historic, historical or event is on the horizon. So is there some level of objective the local community can reach even we are seeing this historical trend is happening. So that I think that is an interesting question is a, I don't have answers. We probably have to see. <laughs> Matthew? I think that everyone raised really good points about that. Um, I would say that I would still stick with they got, um, I didn't think that they had to per se fight for their land. But I do think an interesting point is that even in Hong Kong, they worked extremely hard in making the opposition or the protesters, an international group. 
uh, making them, otherizing them in a way and putting them in a position where they were not part of the body politic. And I think that that was a protective mechanism like you guys have already pointed out to not give them the opportunity to say, yes, they are a part of China, but they're special. They can do this and no one else can because like you have already pointed out, the virus could spread. I think that um, that shows that it was an international issue for them and they were worried still about projections of power coming from uh, foreign lands and foreign groups but it is very viable that they were also very concerned about that projection of power spreading into lands within China and um, and I guess spreading through and corroding the, the mainland as well. So I think both um, areas of thought are uh, very relevant to this. Yeah. So my last question to all of you, and we, we end with this because I, it, it's just so perfect, COVID, COVID, what do you think would, would and, and I'll, I'll ask it in two ways, and you can respond any way you all, you all like. I mean, for me, in, in, as, as I went through the essays in the book, COVID became the critical factor. Um, where this thing was going by the end of December 2019 and where it wound up in April of 2020 uh, was in large part the ability of at least the central authorities to take advantage of and to leverage the possibilities inherent in the global hysteria about COVID and the um, willingness of states, including the liberal democratic states, to be protective, and I'm, I'm using euphemistic terms, to be protective. Um, and, and so my question is, uh, would we have had the same result without COVID or put it a different way, uh, how decisive was COVID in, in all of this? And will the ghost of COVID and its permissions now tend to guide reactions even after COVID is gone? So. I think COVID is historical. This will be on the books and uh, studied uh, hundreds of years later. And uh, this is a turning point. And uh, there is an endless discussions of why this is a turning point. Uh, but to be just a short, I think there are a list of things that is accelerating and, uh, and you can see it is dramatically transforming our global trade, global economy from global to the national, to the local communities. It changes impact on every persons, not only, not only small people, individual family, but also big global international companies, the supply chain, everything is changing. We are, we are in this very, I don't know, you say it's accelerating or reckless or, <laughs> or doomsday <laughs> situation, but it's definitely you feel is things going too fast and uh, and it's hard to respond and to take a breath and understand and to have a good understanding out of it. So I see more of the dangers in it and it requires patience and a cautious to proceed. <clears throat> and, and unfortunately, I don't think, I don't think a current political landscape or even the people's understanding is equipped ourselves to navigate this safely or smoothly. Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember during the uh, when the COVID is full blown here in the U.S. I I talked to my during that time I talked to a lot of uh, my uh, uh, Chinese colleagues right back in China who are you know, especially the ones that's very democratically uh, minded or pro-democracy uh, scholars. And they were extremely frustrated and furious uh, of the US and European response to COVID more so I feel like even than say people here or in Europe. And th their frustration a lot, of, you know, I kept hearing this, it's just like, you know, uh, the, the way that the, you know, European American uh, authority government responded. COVID has made their position 
much harder to argue because for decades, right, since the reform and opening up, those are more liberal, right, leaning scholars in China, they've been arguing on the, uh, you know, democrat, democratic uh, reform, liberal governance reform on a basis that, you know, look at those uh, in Europe, look at US, right? They just produce this much more stable, prosperous and functional, right, uh, society and institutions. And, and for the longest time, yeah, that's very persuasive, I think. And, but this has, uh, you know, especially during a time when the pro-democracy, let's just say, scholars are most already sidelined since uh, 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 in the current uh, uh, administration, this COVID, you know, often making them, they feel like, at least you know, whether it's true or not, at least they feel like it has make their uh, positions a laughing stock and difficult to argue, right, for uh, within China. And I, I think there's similar, you know, perf uh, uh, impact on the you know credibility right of pro democracy voices in hong kong as well just like you know uh, expressed by uh, in mainland pro democracy scholars uh, with regard to the way uh, uh, right how not so effective compared to uh, uh, you know in europe and us has responded to this uh, uh, pandemic that's uh, on the one level but on the other level, though, so if there's anything that's uh, good or good to hope for, right? So I don't know if it will, anything good will come out of it. But if there's anything that good that we can still hope for is that, like what uh, William suggested, and I fully agree, regardless of whether or not the kids in Hong Kong who did the protest explicitly express this or not, right? A lot of the underlying uh, frustration that fueled this uh, ongoing movement is the fact that, uh, right, uh, I think it's rooted in economic, socioeconomic realities of Hong Kong, and especially the younger generations in Hong Kong, they cannot see themselves as they be able to uh, afford a quality of life and life, you know, general life prospect the way that their parents' generations afford it. And that's a, a huge issue, right? And if we are, seeing that right one of the implications everyone talking about is COVID, it's a kind of will lead to some kind of a redistribution of wealth right we can hope for that in hong kong or elsewhere right it will be redistributed in a way that doesn't end up right locking the future of the younger generations even further right doesn't further you know enrich the you know the big real estate the field real estate development clans in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, uh, so that, that if it, it can work in a way that actually distribute, redistribute wealth, right, whether this COVID crisis in Hong Kong to make the island uh, economy long-term viable and give a lot of opportunity for its uh, younger generations, then that's, you know, that's certainly one possibility that we can hope for, I will say. End up with a positive note, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say that um, COVID was obviously a huge, huge um, accelerator and a major issue, as other people have said. I think in kind of a few few ways is one, um, which you know, as 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 Gao and Karen were saying, I mean, there's the there's that notion that I think once China, um, you know, had COVID the crisis in January February, but then started to be one of the leaders in kind of getting it under control while the West kind of went into chaos in April and May of 2020. I think that that kind of um, shifted people's perceptions of, of the CCP and the relative effectiveness uh, versus democracy. But I mean, going back on another level, um, you know, when they announced to the, the security law in May, the, the EU and the US or the EU countries in the US were dealing with just unbelievably bad COVID situation. That was really the only story in the media. So I think that that was an opportune time to kind of get, get away with it. Um, and then on another level, you have to look at COVID and Trump. So in 2019, according to, uh, what is it? I forget the, the journalist's name who wrote the book about the trade deal between the Wall Street Journal reporters who wrote the book about uh, Trump and the trade deal. But basically what they said is one of the things is that 
Um, during 2019, Trump didn't bring this up because of the precariousness of negotiating the trade deal. And C was reluctant to really crack down hard in 2019 because of the, trade, the, the precariousness of the trade deal. And once that fell apart, once it was agreed to in 2020, but then fell apart due to COVID, um, I think that had severe ramifications. One is then Trump got angry. He, um, you know, he started, he was told by C apparently that, you know, COVID will go away with warmer weather. And he kind of believed that um, kind of being a low information person. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then he kind of blamed, blamed China for various things and China became the all around scapegoat. And, you know, we had the CCP virus, the China virus, the Kung flu, and all sorts of hatred were heaped on China. And at that point, I mean, imagine yourself as the Chinese leadership. You know, you're thinking, well, our, you know, we won't do this thing in Hong Kong because of our relative international prestige will take a hit. But if your international prestige is getting Trump, you know, going through the mud, and in many cases unfairly, then I think they just thought, well, you know, screw it, let's just go for it. So I think that, that there's not only COVID and the distraction of the public in main countries, but also the way that China was demonized during the COVID period. And then of course, Pompeo got more power relative in the administration to do kind of one China action after another. And you might say that those were justified or not, but I think from the China's point of view, you know, they had little to lose then by, by taking the step for the NSL, which um, I think surprised everyone. So I think COVID is definitely a major thing, but for, for various reasons. Um, I would say that COVID was an uh, accelerator, it was a distractor, but I think one of the biggest factors that it played was uh, it improved corporate fle flexibility. Um, these corporations, many of them felt like they were under threat, under barrage when COVID started. Some people thought many of them would not survive. A lot of them came out stronger on the other side as you know, the proverbial, if it doesn't kill you, it makes it stronger. They came out stronger on the other side and they realized that they could get the smartest minds in the room and be flexible enough to not only work around, but succeed in one of the most hostile business climates in a hundred years from something that none of us had ever lived through. All that does is embolden them to the point where these corporate empires now are able to sit there and say, how much can we deal with? And I question in the future, will they be more reluctant to use the, um, I guess the corporate pressures in the international community as were pointed out in the book with the Cathay uh, airline situation? Um, will they be more willing to work around countries rather than, rather than trying to impose human rights onto a country? Um, and will the smartest minds in the room say, hey, it, it's not worth it because we can figure out another way rather than trying to change that country. And a point I will make to that uh, is saying there's, I'm on social media, of course, because, well, I am a 24 year old man and probably everyone in here is on social media because you're humans. But one of the uh, memes that was floating around is a BMW symbol uh, next to uh, the Nazis and I believe 1944 or 1943. And then there is a BMW symbol with the, um, with the rainbow of Pride Month. And I guess the, the messaging there was to say they will roll with whatever is popular at the moment to survive. And these, co these companies have learned to survive, to be flexible. And how flexible are they? How much are they willing to take? And what human rights values are important to them will be important to us in the future. And I think COVID taught them that they can make it through just about anything. And, and so I think that that flexibility will be uh, important in the future. And that, of course, is the introduction to my next book. <laughs> I will not touch in this one. But yeah, the, the, um, that, that had been a little bit of the elephant in the room. We, we didn't have time to, to discuss, but the role of uh, Hong Kong sitting in the, the crossroads of global trade. We talked a little bit about global trade from a public perspective, but um, the, the role of private enterprises and their ability to roll with this, to survive this any way it came out, um, and to survive the, um, the, the protests on the streets 
um, might also have played uh, both an interesting role at the time, but my guess is probably the lessons that they will be drawing, which will be very peculiar and specific lessons, are likely to show up in all kinds of odd places that we're not going to really be able to see for another year or two or three. Um, but with that, uh, we, I have, I have uh, really burdened your time tremendously. Um, I really appreciate the, the, the commentary. This is just brilliant. Uh, you've given, you've certainly given me enough uh, uh, materials for at least two or three more books. Uh, the perspectives were uh, really quite amazing, and I really appreciate uh, your time and willingness to, to slug through both the materials and then to sit here and, and, and have a conversation about it. So thank you all. Um, and I don't know if, you, if you've got any uh, very brief last words that we can close with, but if you do, please. Well, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, it's really fun. And uh, I had a great time to talk with Green Minds. Thank you. I did as well. It was nice to hear other people's perspectives other than, you know, the great author of this book because, well, <laughs> he, he plays me. But um, uh, thank you all for coming to this. And thank you for inviting me, Professor Backer. All right. And then, sorry, William. Uh, thank you very much, Larry, for, for inviting me. And I've, I've really learned a lot from everybody's comments and perspectives. Um, and just, uh, you know, we should all pay attention to Hong Kong. Uh, contrary to public opinion, it's not dead. <laughs> There's still, still many people living there. So, uh, you know, it's not over. Karen? Okay. Yes, uh, I agree. Definitely, we should, should keep an eye on this. Uh, uh, it's still very much a fluid, uh, evolving uh, situation. And what unfolds uh, in Hong Kong too might be one way or another, especially at this time, uh, be a little kind of a, a scope towards the things to come, I think, even beyond Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong in some sense, it's a little bit interestingly representative uh, of a, a kind of a, uh, a future, and I'm not just talking about governance, but how corporations, like uh, Matt, Matt mentioned, uh, uh, evolve and weather through somehow even more effectively than the, uh, the public institutions in this case. But yeah, thank you so much for your always uh, very impressive, uh, Professor Backer, you bring very kind of, uh, 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 you know, interesting, talented folks together discussing interesting and, uh, you know, important subject matter. So it's definitely, again, uh, 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 very nice to do this once again with you. And I uh, very much enjoy your uh, Hong Kong book as well. So oh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So my last word, because I, I wrote the book, I, I'm going to, I'm going to commandeer the last word. And that is buy this book. So who's ever listening, buy the book. It's really cheap. Um, it, sorry, inexpensive. We, uh, by English is my second language. I have to remember that you can't say cheap. It's just very inexpensive and affordable. Uh, it's available on Kindle, Amazon, Apple, and your favorite retailers. So buy the book. And again, everyone, thank you very, very much. Thank you.